Hey, Mr. Heinrich here. What's up, AP Physics 1 students? We're looking at Unit 7 FRQ2 from the AP Classroom Progress Checks. Let's get after it. So we have an oscillating system. Let's read what they want us to know. Figure 1 shows a block of mass M hanging from a spring and oscillating in the vertical direction. Figure 2 is a graph of the block's height H above the floor as a function of time T. The block oscillates with a period capital T in the range 0.8 h max is less than or equal to h is less than or equal to h max during its motion, where h max is the maximum height reached by the block. The dots in figure 3 represent the block at three different times. t equals half the period, t equals three-fourths the period, and t equals the full period. Part A. In figure 3, indicate the block's acceleration at each time shown as follows. If the acceleration is zero at any time or times, write A equals zero just below the corresponding dot. If the acceleration is non-zero at any time or times, indicate the direction of the acceleration by drawing an arrow that starts on and points away from the corresponding dot, and it can either be up or down is what they're referring to. Okay, now we're dealing with these three different times, which puts me at H max, 0.9 H max, and 0.8 H max. I need to remember something about simple harmonic motion. Well, at this position, my spring mass system is fully compressed, and it's about to go down. Therefore, there must be a restoring force that is pointing down and is maximum at that point of maximum compression. When the system uncoils and gets to 0.9 H max at a time three quarters the period, the spring mass system is at equilibrium, and to be at equilibrium means there is zero restoring force. And finally, as the spring mass system stretches all the way to its maximum extension, at time equals the full period, the system is about to kick back upward, and therefore there is a maximum restoring force pointing up. So why did I take all that time to discuss restoring force? Because acceleration is directly proportional to restoring force and in the same direction. So if I have a maximum restoring force at one half capital T downward, then I have a maximum downward acceleration at one half capital T. If I get to 0.9 H max when my time is three quarters capital T and I have a zero restoring force, then I have a zero acceleration. And last but not least, when I get to the bottommost part of my oscillation at 0.8 H max or time capital T, I have a maximum upward restoring force and thus a maximum upward acceleration. So on these three dots, I would draw a downward arrow at one half capital T. I would write A equals zero at three quarters capital T. And finally on the third dot, at time equals capital T or the full period, I would draw an upward arrow that was the same length as this downward arrow. And that's it for part A, let's move on to part B. So for part B, we are considering the same exact time range. We're talking about half the period, all the way to the full period, so this portion of the graph. All right, part B, starting with either the work energy theorem or the relation work equals the parallel force times distance, derive expressions for the following quantities in terms of mass, M, H max, capital T, the period, and physical constants as appropriate. Begin your derivation by writing either a fundamental physics principle or an equation from the reference book. So we need to identify the work of gravity, the work net, and the work of the spring in terms of these ideas, and of course gravitational acceleration g is fine. Let's go to the paper. And just as a quick aside, there are the visual answers to part a that I was just discussing, but let's get over here to the work of gravity, and remember it's in terms of that stuff right there. Now if I'm thinking about my system, then I need to think about what gravity is doing during this time period at these three different locations. Well, gravity is a constant force. It's not changing throughout this oscillation. And so I'm going to draw the same force of gravity in at all locations. And you can see that it's acting through this distance. Now, what is this height? This is h max. This down here is 0.8 h max. And this is 0.9 h max. Now the equation they refer to is the parallel force to the distance traveled. So if I went from h max to 0.8 h max, didn't I travel a total distance of 0.2 h max? The answer is yes. So all I have to do for this part is that the work of gravity would be the force parallel to that distance, which is gravity, times the distance, which we just said was 0.2 
h max, but the force of gravity is not one of my given terms. So what am I going to put in place? Of course, I'm going to put in place mg, which is equivalent to the force of gravity. And it's always a good idea to put our numbers in front of the whole expression. So my final expression will read 0.2 mgh max. Box it. And for the second part of part B, they're asking for work net. Now they told us we could use the force parallel times distance, which we just did, but they also told us we could use the work energy theorem, which is work net equals the change in kinetic energy. So during that time period, what do we know? We know that this is our initial position where our velocity is zero because the system has come to its maximum compression and is about to turn around. And we know at the final position, when it's at its maximum extension, the system has also stopped and is ready to turn around. Then what's my initial kinetic energy and what's my final kinetic energy? It would be zero and it would be zero. So therefore, if work net is equal to the change in kinetic energy, which expands to kinetic energy final minus kinetic energy initial, and both of my kinetic energies are zero, then I simply have that work net is equal to zero minus zero, which is, yeah, zero joules. And I can box that. You don't need to include the joule. It's just a habit for me. Let's go on to the last part of part B. We're looking at the work of the spring. Now, work net is also defined find as something else besides the change in kinetic energy. What does net anything mean? Net means to sum up all of the things involved. So if I'm talking about work net, I hope you also remember that would be the sum of all the work done by all the different forces. So work net could also be expressed as the work of gravity plus the work of the spring, and that is the work that I'm looking for. Well, I know that it's 0.2 mgh, and I know this, it's zero. So let's solve for the work of the spring. So rearranging the equation, we get work of the spring is equal to work net minus the work of gravity. Work of the spring would be equal to zero minus 0.2 mgh max. And my final answer, zero minus this would be negative 0.2 mgh max. And I'm gonna box that answer. So I find students get confused by this idea of work net equals zero. They take it to mean that there's no work being done. But all it means is that when you sum up all of the works being done, it totals up to zero. Take, for instance, me lifting this pen at a constant speed. There would be a force upward times a displacement, and that's a positive work because the force is in the same direction and parallel to the displacement. But at the same time that I lift the pen at a constant speed, I know gravity is an equal and opposite force to my applied force, but that gravity is opposite to the displacement, and therefore it's a negative work. So you would have, let's say, a positive 10 joules and a negative 10 joules of work being done simultaneously, and when you took the network, you would have a network of zero. Okay, let's move on to part C. All right, consider the time range zero is less than or equal to T is less than or equal to one half capital T and take the upward direction to be positive. C1, on figure four, sketch a graph of the body's velocity V as a function of the block's height H above the floor. And C2, on figure five, sketch a graph of the block's acceleration as a function of the block's height above the floor. So the first thing to note here is we're talking about the first half of the oscillation from our picture way up here, this time period. So at this position, what's going on with my velocity? I have come to a maximum extension and I'm just not moving. When I'm here, we've had all of this distance from 0.8 h max to 0.9 h max to accelerate the system upward. So by the time we get to equilibrium, our system is moving very quickly. In fact, we have a maximum velocity at equilibrium. And then from 0.9 h max to h max, the system begins to decelerate because the restoring force is trying to act down downward, and therefore, when we get to h max, again, we're at zero velocity. So zero velocity, maximum upward velocity, therefore positive velocity, and then zero velocity. So what does that look like on our graph? Well, you should put a dot here. You should put a dot here because we maxed out our velocity, and then once again, we came to zero velocity when we made it to h max. And it's important that you realize this is simple harmonic motion, which takes on the shape in your graph of a sine or a cosine curve. So if you can picture this graph being extended, we would connect the dots like the upper half of a sine curve. And then if time was allowed to pass, we would see the opposite version of that graph. Second graph for figure five. 
Well, acceleration and velocity are counterpointed in simple harmonic motion. And if you've been paying attention to this video, you're going to understand already. At this position, I have a maximum upward restoring force and thus a maximum upward acceleration. And remember, up is taken to be positive. When we get to equilibrium, there is no more restoring force and therefore acceleration is zero. And when I finally get to the very top, the system is finally slowed down in its compression. It's about to turn around and go down. And so I have a maximum downward restoring force, therefore a maximum downward acceleration. And remember, down is negative in this example, so this would be a maximum negative acceleration. Taking that to the graph, I'd have a maximum positive acceleration, zero acceleration, and a maximum negative acceleration. Now, if you connect those three dots with a straight line, you would probably get full credit. But really what's going on is you have this kind of curve that goes into a straight line, then back to a curve. I'm gonna put both of these graphs on the paper so that you can visualize what I'm talking about. You have a dot here, a dot here, a dot here, no velocity, maximum positive velocity, zero velocity again, and you have this type of graph just like that. Remember, if this extended, you would have this nice traditional sine type of curve. Okay, going over here, you have a maximum positive acceleration, zero acceleration, a maximum negative acceleration at H max. And again, you could draw the straight line, but more correctly would be something like that. All right, part C is done. Let's go on to part D. And here our prompt says, indicate whether either one of your graphs you drew in part C is consistent or not consistent with the expression for work net you derived in part B and justify your answer. And this is a pretty easy justification, so I'm just going to verbalize it to you. Here we go. I would say the velocity graph I drew in part C is consistent with the work net expression I derived in part B. From my graph in part C, my beginning velocity and my ending velocity are both zero. Then say, based on the equation I developed in part B, and in parentheses write work net equals Ke final minus Ke initial, and then show each one of those kinetic energies crossed out to zero, put that in parentheses, then you would write both kinetic energies were zero, which corresponds to the zero velocities indicated in my graph in part C. And that's all you got to write. You're done with that one. Mr. Heinrich, I'm out of here. Like, subscribe, and I'll talk to you soon.